Hey, this is John Reed, Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio back in action despite a number of technical issues that uh, I'm going to th throw my Mac computer under the bus that I had to use. But I got back by popular demand. I got Brian Summer. Hi, everybody. Returning or, favorite. Or howdy, everybody, as uh, some folks like to hear. But go ahead. The audience demanded it, and you are back. Uh, we have some surprises for the listeners today. Uh, yes, we do. Um, so I even have a couple surprises, I think, for you. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, okay. But but our our show today is uh, HR tech blowout inspired by a recent piece of yours. Uh, this is a countdown format, so we're going to do uh, we're going to count down our our top HR tech hated buzzwords as well as some things that inspire us actually in HR, which is really going to be a shock for our listeners. So. We shall see. Well, and let's let's make sure everyone knows that uh, deep, deep, deep down within the snark that uh, you and I possess, we will we are already working on our list of unpredictions for 2021. And uh, you know, if you've got the time, uh, John, let's let's tease that a little bit, uh, maybe later on in the broadcast. How about that? Oh, absolutely. Yes, indeed. The the unpredictions are never uh, more important than they are right now. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to I'm going to push into the chat uh, my LinkedIn profile. Uh, you can watch this broadcast on just about any of these. Brian, you can click on that and sh sh find the post with my live broadcast in there and share it to your audience. And then you can exit LinkedIn after that. Hopefully you won't have a problem there. Just let me know if you do. For anyone else, you can watch it on any platform, but you might like LinkedIn a little better um, just because it's a little more interactive, but any of the platforms are fine. You can post comments on any of them and we are gonna take your comments. So we are gonna answer your uh, questions on HR project success in the enterprise, uh, why, why it's so elusive or alternately what it takes to do it right. So um, so th is that, did that work, Brian? Was it? Did, I got it and I'm sharing it right now. Okay, so, perfect. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. LinkedIn doesn't give me an opportunity to, uh, to, to post that in advance. But the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, for our listeners at the end, I'm going to get into the audio part of this a little bit because some of you are listening to the audio only version of this. So uh, it is originally a video, but it's also audio for those of you who want that. So I'll get to that at the very end of the broadcast. In the meantime, it's time to get down to business. So before we get to our buzzwords, though, and our most hated HR tech buzzwords, I do want to talk with Brian a little bit about your your piece, HR Tech 2020, uh, on Diginomica that you published a couple weeks ago uh, after the HR Tech show online. Murky signs of what's next in HR with a, with a hint of clarity. For the folks that didn't catch that piece, what, what was kind of your general impression? I find it really interesting that uh, the contrast between that particular virtual event and the real face-to-face -face one. For those who don't know, that show is massive. There are thousands of people who show up there to kick tires on 200 or more different kinds of HR products and to rub shoulders with peers and, 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 and. And it goes on for like three plus days and that's before you count in all the all the parties the after parties the mixers and the analyst briefings and everything else uh, on a given one of those events i normally would interview 18 to 22 software companies in that time frame but it was killer for being able to just plop down at a table full of customers of different products and just talk to them and find out what are you looking at? Why are you looking at it? What's going on and everything else? And as you can guess where I'm leading with this is you couldn't really do that in a virtual event. In fact, the number of vendors I was able to talk to this year was down quite a bit. Uh, the number of customers was almost negligible. And uh, uh, and it made it really hard to figure out you know, like what's what's the real pulse of what's going on in this market? It's tough to figure out. I know talking to some other peers of mine, um, you know, we all talk to our own collections of customers, prospects, clients, what have you. And it's only through com comparing notes with sometimes competitors do I even 
have a way to validate some of the stuff that's going on. So that's why I'm saying it's it's tough to figure out what's really happening, but there are some signs that you can divine out all that. And that was the what was behind the headline. And and what if you had to give kind of a state of of HR tech or you know kind of an overall grade for how much HR tech is helping customers right now? What what would you say? Where 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 is HR tech? I mean, I know the vendors are telling you that they're kicking ass with their next generation modern platforms for employee experience. But what, what would you say? Uh, well, I really want you to ask me about employee experience somewhere on this call today. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, I've been doing a ton of digging in that area. But, but you're, the main point here is uh, talk's been cheap in this in the software space during the pandemic with every vendor saying they've got all kinds of new capabilities. They've been instantly rolling them out, you know, and creating apps where no app existed before. Um, you know, it's a classic response to a very uh, dangerous or deadly situation as people want to be seen in heroic roles. And there's some of that kind of chest thumping and, oh, you know, look at me, look at what we did. And frankly, it can get a bit off-putting, particularly when you hear it time and time again. Uh, the, the reality, though, is uh, where it really mattered is, are they helping customers like financially? Do they have some great new kind of safety and reopening kind of technologies? There's a lot of that going on. I, I don't want to be dismissive here. They, there are a lot of HR vendors who are creating a lot of that. Uh, but I think some of the bigger questions about what are you going to do, HR, when you try and rehire the people, the thousands of people that you laid off? I mean, have you really thought about the damage you did to your recruiting brand, to your uh, to your just employment brand? What are you going to do to um, to get people better energized about your firm when you did so many things at the beginning of this pandemic that kind of really cut people cut people pretty badly from hurting their livelihood, their ability to take care of their families? Yeah, a lot of companies got an unwanted gut check, right, on on how well they really treat their people. We kind of found out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I didn't hear – I hear a lot – I heard a lot from the vendors I spoke with. They're doing technical things to help companies, but I don't really hear I, – I heard almost nothing about what are you doing – uh, to help your customers kind of rebuild and their credibility from a recruiting and, you know, people management perspective. So you basically, you don't hate HR tech as much as you hate ERP then. This, this is good. This is good. Well, I, I'm sure if anybody's listening to this, they know that I cover more than HR. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, uh, right now, I got the bit between my teeth on a, some of the ERP vendors and their lack of uh, material progress and their venal money grabbing kind of ways. But that's another subject probably for another one of your broadcasts. Yeah. And in fact, we have one of those in the archives too, folks, if you want to check it out. Uh, Brian and I are going to uh, launch into uh, an HR buzzword most hated HR buzzword countdown in just a little bit, uh, which was a really tough decision because there's so many ridiculous HR buzzwords. But um, I brought a whole list. <laughs> excellent. I brought a whole list of them. excellent. Um, and and we don't we don't know what the other one picks. This is going to be going to be interesting to see if we have any crossover in our in our list. Um, so uh, for any of you listening who are watching, uh, you're welcome to comment. I'm starting to think that maybe the commenting thing isn't working because I haven't seen a comment yet, which is a little surprising. But anyway, uh, comment anytime. We will actually interrupt what we're talking about to address your questions. So, well, uh, in fact, in fact, let's let the audience chip in with some of the things they're the most uh, fatigued about or whatever in listening to or oh, the most irritating buzzwords. Oh, I think somebody's oh, going to jump talent in. Talent management. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you mean talent can't be managed? Oh. Uh, let's not go there. Let's not let, let's not try to understand these as much as criticize these. Okay, let's go there. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, here we have a good one. AI. AI, oh, oh, your AI you. cloud, right? Yeah. You know, I got a feeling, John, we're going to unleash a tsunami here, and these people are going to make our list pale in comparison. So we'll have to see. <laughs> um, I mean, if you want, I'll tell you, John, uh, John asked to come in with four. So I kind of went through my list. And I came up with four that I thought were particularly odious. Cool. So um, 
Yeah, we're going to count those down. But Brian, I got to ask you, what the heck is going on behind you? We, we got to address your background. Well, uh, you know, I, I have traveled a little bit. I have been to a couple of shows along the line. And oh, hi, Stephanie. And um, uh, and Stephanie, thank you for she sent me a goodie bag for Thanksgiving. And oh. uh, my wife has already destroyed it. So anyway, uh, thanks for that. Uh, anyhow, um, uh, the background here, I, I was telling John, I've probably been to, I don't know, 1,200 events. And, I, and um, one time, there uh, one great anecdote about this, there was a ERP litigation case, and there was a question about, was I qualified to be an expert witness on it? So I brought a about a cubic yard of lanyards and name badges to the attorney's office one day and go, all right. Boom, set it down on the table. You think you can find an expert who's been to more of these things and listen to more, you know, stories? Go for it. You go find them. And uh, that was the end of that, uh, that issue. So we were good. Yeah. The only thing is I, I feel bad for some of the vendors that, that got excluded from your badge collection because you're probably going to get some heat from those that didn't get exposure this oh. time. Folks, I got seriously. I've got hundreds of these badges and boxes and everything else. Oh, Stephanie chips in with benchmarking. Yeah, yeah. That's what uh, I think. That's a term that came out of baseball. You know, for people who just mark time sitting on the bench. Yeah, but anyway, um, but I, I hear you. All right. Well, uh, uh, oh, gender pay gap reporting. <laughs> Okay. Um, you don't like gender pay gap. It not, probably not the sexiest buzzword, buzzword ever. No, um, no. Um, I, I think I can beat that one, though. I mean, I don't want to sound, come off cocky or anything here, but I think I can beat it. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's do, we're going to do them one at a time to kind of roll it out a little bit. So let's, uh, let's start with your number four. My number four comes with a musical accompaniment. And for those of you... See if you can recognize this. Mm. Is that the last IBM keynote? <laughs> no. Sorry. That, that was the age of Aquarius, if you remember. Oh, and, the age of Aquarius, right. Yeah. and uh, there, I, I, was, I was close then. Uh, yeah. Okay. There you go. And um, and that goes to my number four worst HR buzzword: the age of agility. And uh, I, I I find that really offensive in this pandemic deal because I'm sure we're going to have uh, others are going to volunteer in here. I mean, age of resilience, age of scalability, age of whatever. But the age of agility just really gets under my skin right now. Anyway, that's my number four one. Uh, people analytics is actually on my honorable mention. So nice job, LinkedIn user for that. We'll give you a, we'll give you a nice little bell for that one. Good yeah, job. Good one. Good one. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, to, to be fair, there are some important challenges regarding, uh, HR data, but we'll, we'll get to that probably later. Um, I'm going to give you my number four and Brian, this, this one actually came through, through you in a sense. Um, divinity consultants oh oh and and this this comes by way of uh lori rudiman's weekly punk rock hr newsletter which i highly recommend you said you sent it my way I'll, I'll second that she she's she ought to be a a member of your broadcast because she's got just the right amount of snark in there to drop in on this stuff she's good Anyway, I'm going to read this excerpt that where she described this. And divinity consultants were actually laid out in a New York Times article. But sh she writes, every popular work trend of 2020 is terrible. From virtual happy hours to misting employees with disinfectant as they return to work. I also read an article about organizations. By the way, this is a New York Times article, as I pointed out, that hire divinity consultants who design, quotes, sacred rituals for leaders and their spiritually depleted employees. She goes on to say, do you know what causes spiritual depletion? Racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, ageism, excessive executive compensation, lack of affordable child care, expensive health and welfare benefits. Want to lift up your community? Don't give them a corporate God. Give them equal op access to opportunity and fair pay. Lori, laying it down. 
I got to say, that's solid stuff there. Solid stuff. She calls it like it is. I mean, I get people always come after me about being either blunt and to the point or couching things in some Texas euphemism. But, uh, man, Lori just hits it out of the park in her commentary on HR. LinkedIn user has um, right sizing. I'm I'm sorry to say that you're starting to fall behind. It's now right sourcing, (laughs) which is the proper mix of where you source your various headcount for your HR operations. So right sizing was 2019. Right sourcing is 2020. So I'm sure you love to know right sourcing as well. So now you have another one you can use and impress your friends in Zoom conversations this weekend. Well, number three, my number three is a two word expression. It's not really so much a buzzword, but it in it's always in front of every possible kind of press release or conference you see, and it's master class. It's always master class on I don't know diversity, master class on whatever. Um, and you know when I see, unfortunately, so many of the the talks, it's these shows are things like uh, a master class on empathy. And my answer to that is, who cares? And, um, you know, the real empathetic, you know, view of that. But that is the most overused description of something that has nothing that rarely resembles anything of training or education, hardly at all. I mean, the, kudos to the people who do great master classes, but there's so many pretenders out there. It's really, it's really diminished the power of that, what that is. I'm having a flash on an old New Wave song, Let's Play Master and Servant. I don't know why. It seems to fit in there somehow. Uh, you know, the so-called uh, guru strutting in front of us with, with uh, imparting these pearls of wisdom. John, so, I, want, I want to give a shout out. Whoever that LinkedIn user that, that put in permanent flexibility, you should be an ERP marketer, uh, sir or ma'am. That is outstanding because that's exactly the kind of flexibility you want with a piece of software that could not be changed by 20,000 consultants on a 20-year-long project. So kudos. That's a killer one right there. All right, Brian, for my number three, I've got – Predictive pre-selection. Oh, tell me about that. <laughs> Predictive pre-selection, baby. You got you to gotta get on this for, for 2021. Using predictive analytics in your pre-selection process with the help of data gathered from your current workforce, Brian, did you know you could make predictions on the future success of your applicants? And, and by the way, my editorial note on that is regardless of whether you onboard them properly, treat them fairly, promote them wisely, don't, or, and don't put them in harm's way by forcing them to return to the office prematurely. Either way, predictive pre-selection will tell you all you need to know about your future employee's success, regardless of whatever you need to do to make it happen. So I think that's pretty amazing technology. That, that's almost intelligent HR, I would say. Uh, yeah, and you almost sounded like you were given the infomercial for it. So uh, good job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm all about it. Move along. Number two for me, uh, a particularly galling one is the future of work. And John and I will talk about some unpredictions at the end of this talk. But John and I, our our inboxes are crammed every year with people who want to connect us with some you know exec who's going to tell us that 2021 is going to be the year of cloud applications. I mean, it's always some BS out of date kind of uh, deal. And unfortunately, people need to be, they need to have a certified letter that shows their crystal ball talents uh, before we would even think of that. And we don't even publish anything real from a predictions deal. And how anybody can predict anything this year is beyond me. And I know John's got something to say on that point, because I've seen you tweeting about this issue lately. (laughs) Yeah, I'll, I'll get on that a little bit later in our in our episode. But the anyone who tells you uh, that they know the future of work, you might want to run and hide. Yeah. Uh, what's your number two? S- uh, whoops, super jobs. Oh, super jobs. It's it's not a you real did- well well known phrase yet, but it's one that I picked up on from from the People Matters website. Now, do you have to be from Krypton to get a, a super job? No, it turns out you just have to elbow the robots robots out of the way and keep your current job. 
As machines, uh, Brian, as machines take over mundane tasks, companies are increasingly redesigning jobs to focus on finding the human dimension. We're already seeing it happen. Organizations must handhold and upskill employees to help them contribute. And these are so-called super jobs requiring highly cognitive competencies like communication and collaboration and learning agility. So um, basically the way I translate it is super jobs are the only jobs left. So... I wish I had I wish I had a video clip of the great Super Dave. I don't know if you remember him. That was an old reference back on Super Dave Osborne, uh, the hapless whatever. I don't know. All right, never mind. Well, my number one um, is something that made me fall out of my chair when I saw it. It was part of someone's prediction, and it was called, and I kid you not, the Internet of Engagement. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I think somebody was really reaching in the buzzword generator to come up with the combination of those. Oh, at super jobs. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, that one, I, I don't know if it's going to catch on, John. I've got my doubts that the internet of engagement is going to mm. really, you know, have staying power for 2021. I bet you. Yeah. You may have trouble logging in actually to see the. <laughs> See the internet. You might have well, to do like a password reset first. And amazing enough, I got a PR uh, press release not minutes after I read that from another company where this lady wants to speak to me about this may be the end of the HR intranet. And I'm thinking to myself, mm -hmm. I haven't seen anybody write about an intranet in probably 10 plus years. So uh, maybe this is a maybe she's on to something that's going to cycle back around in the marketplace going forward. All right. I hate to guess what you're going to say. What's your number one most uh, irksome um, HR buzzword? Uh, well, you know, I, I went a little off, off grid. I had a few different choices because I have some honorable mentions um, that, that, uh, that are classic like human capital analytics. Um, but we already kind of covered that a little bit. So I went with, um, I went with zero drag. Oh, uh, zero zero drag is a physics term implying frictionless movement of a physical object. But Brian, the term is also used to describe employees that have no familial obligations. <laughs> I hate it and love it the way you talk like you're a pitch man for late night TV. But that's not all, John. We'll also get our frictionless uh, diversity and inclusion program too. Um, mm. anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so zero zero drag hiring is a discriminatory discriminatory hiring practice that favors candidates with no spouse or kids. In other words, your family commitments are important, an important barrier to your success. The term has its origins, of course, in Silicon Valley and dot com employers that encourage a zero drag way of life. In other words, your company is a real drag. So that's that's number one for me. But um, I also had Giganomics as an honorable mention, which is has to do with the uh, the you the know gig a high, economy. Yeah, yeah a, a high flutin way of saying that the gig economy is changing everything, and now it's like we had our old jobs, but they're 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 just as good, but they're more flexible now. And you know, never mind that we're stumping for our next project half the friggin' time and trying to pay our rent. But anyway, that's Giganomics, and you know that that's coming up. So we'll have to see. Well, if you want, I can I could quickly rattle off. I'm not going to explain them. I'll just rattle off the others that were on my my honorable. Yeah, list. yeah. What you got? You, you want to hear them? Okay. Well, I, I think I've had enough well being and mindfulness to last me a couple, oh. couple of decades. Okay. Um, I I found someone's uh, deal where they're talking about leading exponential change as a you know a rallying cry for HR. Another one that has me mystified is, and I kid you not, adoptability of change for success. Uh, they must have been trying to get some kind of, um, what's the score when you count how many syllables, you know, uh, anyway, um, something in fog index, that, that's what that one's winning. Another one's called coaching culture. Uh, uh, coaching culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's how you encourage your, come on, Danone, you can be a better culture uh, yogurt. Come on, do it. Do it now. Uh, another one, relationships at work. Mm. Yeah. Uh, unlock people's potential. You know, mm. and, and of course, that begs, then what's the key to unlock? Okay, then there's intelligent HR. And now that one. 
Yeah, I brought that up already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that frosts me to no end because it implies that HR was doing stupid stuff in the past. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah. you know, if I were anybody, if I were in an active HR role, I'd be furious with that term. There's the insights platform. You know, you can't just mm-hmm. have a software platform, but an insights platform. Um, oh, absolutely. And then now you need resilience insights. You, you can't just have any kind of insights. They have to be no, focused resilience. on resilience. Uh, then there's cultivating insights. It's the act of creating insights. That's even, you know, all, it's amazing what a fertile ground that is. Um, and then I was, I know somebody wrote on uh, on our, one of the listeners was talking about, I think it was analytics, but there are a lot of people talking about smart analytics, but I just want to point out to me, there's this smart analytics in a dumb press release. And with that, mm. I'll, I'll let you talk about any of your other candidates you had. Well, Brian, I had human experience because we have to move beyond employee experience. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's, and make it a more holistic human experience now. So that's, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Actually, I'm thinking that we might need to take a break from our broadcast and do kind of a well-being check um, for everyone. But uh, anyhow, while we while we do, well, I'll let you guys do that on your own time. But um, I also had workation. Workation. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Take a vacation. Uh, well, work while you're on vacation. Yeah. 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 Uh, I wrote for that one. I said, in other words, a way for people to cling to their jobs and one up each other in a tough economy while burning themselves out a workation. So <laughs> anyway, do we ever take vacations anymore? It seems like workation is the standard vacation now. Well, that that's why I used to go to all those analyst events, you know, I like, can to all these shows, uh, you know, I, I was on a workation in Vegas and Orlando and everywhere else, for, you know, dozens of times every year. So uh, listen to someone who wrote in here, they wrote about relationships that work under threat because no Christmas parties even working together in the office anymore. You're right. I mean, John and I are being you know, a bit flippant here, but uh, the point we're trying to make is sometimes in the quest for a catchy hook, I guess, for, you know, uh, pitches to analysts and getting something written up on a white paper, you're going to, we're, we're going to hear this stuff. And unfortunately we tend to hear the same things over and over and over again. And what we really care about is what are vendors doing that's truly differentiating and making a difference for customers and can they prove it? So I agree with you. I, you know, I miss that kind of interpersonal contact. So that's a very real point. I don't want to minimize that or any of these other issues, frankly, but we're just kind of having a little fun with uh, the, there's never a shortage of new buzzwords coming out of HR. And that's really the point of it all right now. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, the, the, these issues with, with relationship disconnects are real. I mean, one, I, I'm just writing up a piece now about John Paul Mitchell systems and, uh, and, and they, they're a very close knit culture. And so when they transitioned to remote, they made a big push. Right. And, and then they pushed some really important projects out. They made, they shifted gears and made hand sanitizer and and donated a ton of that. Um, they they built a, a stimulus program for the salons that, that that are struggling that buy from them. So they did a bunch of cool stuff that employees were able to rally around, which is great. But I talking with the VP of IT, he admitted to me that the longer this goes on, the more difficult this cultural issue becomes. Right and right. And, and and the fact that you can't have those easier connection times and. And, you know, while there's been some recent good news about vaccines, I think we would, as sen- sensible people, understand that even if that news pans out, it's it, we're still a very long way from, you know, getting back to where those things are going to be easy. And, in fact, I would much prefer to see companies figure out how to push the envelope on these virtual tools rather than trying to compel people back to the office prematurely. And so these are actually really serious issues. It's just that, with so much with so much crap going on right now, it kind of feels good to be able to laugh at a few things as well. Oh, Thomas, thank you for your leadership and thanking us for our leadership. What a breath of fresh air! I appreciate that tremendously. And the, the, answer your, <laughs> the answer to your question, Thomas, is yes. It's too early, man. We gotta we gotta earn our chops, but it's not too early for us to thank you for for stepping up like this at this time. So. And, we, and we want to encourage everyone on LinkedIn and Twitter, particularly on Twitter, use that hashtag T-Y-F-Y-L. Thank you for 
Yeah, thank you for your leadership. Use that everywhere, uh, and particularly whenever you see self-congratulatory software executives uh, giving themselves a needless pat on the back. Um, that that little phrase, for those who don't know the inside joke, uh, that's something John and I picked up on watching a major vendor's executives uh, pass the baton uh, at a conference once, and they said it all day long, and it was so ridiculous because one of one of the people there, a channel partner, is sitting with John and I for lunch, and he was from, like, the Netherlands. He goes, is this some sort of American thing, this thank you for your leadership? And we go, no, it's some boneheaded vendor thing they're doing here. And we put that phrase on the map, and we know we did some damage with it when the head of analyst relations for that firm found us that afternoon and told us to knock that stuff off, which just empowered us to do it some more. But anyway, yeah. That's the yep. risk you run when you when you want to tangle with the, you know tangle with the bear. <laughs> Indeed. All so right. you know one one of the things that I think that I think is important for us to to hit on as we transition, which you kind of helped us do a minute ago, is is you know yeah, it, it's good to be able to let off some te- some steam with some snark, and I think like I would argue that a healthy amount of cynicism is really important in this industry because so much of what gets pushed out is really refabricated from stuff that already exists. And, you know, a lot of what's considered sexy and new is really unproven um, or in the case of, you know, maybe blockchain or whatever you might even say. Absolute bullshit. So the the, the point is that there's, 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 there's stuff out there that you want to stay away from a little bit. But at the same time, I, I feel that, we need to make a point that the intellectual curiosity should never stop. And, you know, that's something that, you know, I think you and I in our own way both try to find is things that inspire us. And in the end, the goal is to have better projects. And so we're going to shift gears in the conversation because I've asked Brian to come up with his top five keys to successful HR projects because that's really what it comes down to in the end, right, Brian, is that we all want to have more successful projects. Oh, no question about it. Um, and let's just kick it off with, um, uh, let's just dive right into these. The one I think that uh, I'm going to do it in reverse. I'm going to actually start with one of the most important ones. And okay. it's one of the rarest things I see people able to do. Um, and that is really, really, really understand the integrations and the plumbing that's going to have to take place. Um I actually do a lot of design work on projects trying to figure out how we're going to flow information because when you show up on an HR project, which is quite a bit different than uh, some other uh, initiatives, it's an astounding number of integrations that are going to have to happen and information's flowing back and forth. And it, like at one of my clients, they had um, a massive division that had everything and they wanted to now extricate most of the HR stuff out of there and uh, migrate everything to a shared service facility. The problem was, uh, you know, this client had, uh, I think it was like Taleo for recruiting. They had uh, SAP HR on the one side and PeopleSoft products on the other. They had Kronos for time and attendance tracking. And then that's before we get to all the different benefit systems. And before you knew it, we were looking at probably 65 things that had to be integrated. And to be able to continue to operate all the SAP stuff at the division level, we were going to have to like add a new employee, run them through security stuff and everything else and start onboarding and then somehow simultaneously update the records in SAP and stuff going on back and forth all the time. Time information was being captured. Plants has to get moved up. If you have, if somebody thinks an implementation is nothing more than copying data out of the old system and pasting it into like a spreadsheet or flat file and uploading into the new one, they don't know what they're doing uh, because it's the way information flows and what it means is going to be critical. And that's the first, and I think the most important lesson there of all. John. Yeah, that's a good one. And, you know, I I do want to acknowledge that HR projects is a pretty wide umbrella because there is a pretty big difference between a global payroll initiative and uh, you know, and, and say a, a talent management or, or 
AI recruiting project or what have you. Um, so there's a lot under the umbrella, but we're going to have to live with that for our countdown. Um, one of the ones I went with was invest in HR leadership. It's kind of what I think of as the hypocrisy of employee experience, where if HR is fundamentally considered a cost center and not a competitive, competitive differentiator, then I think you're kind of stuck. And, and if HR is a competitive differentiator, you have to pay HR talent like that. And I did a little search just checking this out, and I found a bunch of articles comparing HR salaries with equivalents in finance and marketing, and they generally are inferior. I found a, a title in HBR called Why Do We Ever Go Into HR, <laughs> which was written by talented young MBA types um, that were surveyed. Um, so, so basically, I think, you know, you have to invest in, in HR as a strategic differentiator. And if you say it, but you don't invest in it, then I think you're stuck. So, okay. All right. Number four. Uh, I would say, I'm, I'm going to say talk to the employees of the company, not just HR. The biggest problem with a lot of HR systems is they were designed for HR, bought by HR, implemented, and are expected to be used mostly by HR. And that's probably one of the biggest problems with a lot of the solutions is that that's why there is such a terrible employee experience around a lot of these products. And just because you have a self-service deal doesn't necessarily mean it actually solves the problems that the employees have. And I find sometimes there could be a significant disconnect. And one particular company that I would not take as a client, how about that? Uh, the chief HR officer I found appalling because if she, for example, were on a plane with other uh, employees in her firm, she would not talk to them, meet with them, nothing. She only circulated among the executive team and that's it. She didn't care. And I knew that trying to put in a system with that lack of empathy was going to be a, um, it might, you could technically do it, but you're going to leave behind, that's kind of a, a trail of broken tears. I mean, it was going to be a mess. Anyway. So are you are you down on employee self-service or do you just feel like it needs to be no. framed, framed in a better context? Well, and, and it, I, I like self-service, but I think the question you got to ask and where this comes to bear is you find out when you talk to employees that there are like some benefits that just don't matter. Nobody wants them or use them. Or there are some that are that are uh, somebody put in place that are so hard to administer that no one wants to take advantage of them. Or you find out that the performance review process and how everything gets moved around, it's just a broken mess uh, with regard to how stuff gets moved around or it isn't really paid attention to. When you talk to employees, you find out things like um, uh, they're very frank about uh, th why do we have to have performance reviews all done in October when we won't even know what our new pay will be till like May of the next year? And so what if they then backdate it? They all know that the company's just tr hoping that a bunch of people quit the firm before they have to start paying these increased wages. You know, when you learn things like that, you realize we have a real opportunity to make fundamental change in this company, but you'll never know it if you don't talk to the to the rank and file employees out there. Mm, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, one of the th things I've been noticing in the in the retail sector is this sort of, you know, this this idealization that if you put next gen tech in employees' hands, that that suddenly their morale is going to jump up. And I think a classic a classic misadventure is Amazon, right? That has this huge logistical workforce they're rolling out. And these are some of the craziest, miserable people you could imagine. I've d dealt with some of them when they're trying to find my location to drop off my stuff. They have all the best GPS technology and everything else, but they're, it doesn't feel like they're being treated as anything but gig economy workers being rewarded by the volume of their deals. So I think it's just interesting how next-gen tech in and of itself doesn't make the employee experience better, right? You know, By itself, no. Um You know, I, I I I work real hard to be a zealous advocate for my clients, but uh, if you don't um, if you don't 
if you don't take the time to really understand what's going on and you only approach a problem as a technical problem, then you're going to end up with a, if you end up with a great solution, that was a accident or happenstance. That wasn't uh, really part of the plan. Um, anyway, well, let's, let's move okay, on. To I'll, the next do, one. I'll do my next one. Yeah. Are, are we on, we're on our number four. Is that right? Right. Uh, is it you or me? I can't remember. It's your turn. Think, okay. Um, my, my next one has a buzzword in it, so I screwed up a little bit, but it's don't surveil your employees, empower them. Um, and it's this theme of you're measuring the wrong things. And uh, this is, issue is coming to a head with the remote workforce because there's all kinds of things you can measure now at, with employees now that you've rolled out all these remote tools, right? You, you, can, you can check their logs. You can, you can see when they're on video. You can you can, uh, you know, as, as they come back to work, you can measure their temperatures. There's all kinds of things you can do. Um, but just because you're measuring it doesn't mean that you're making your workforce better or making their jobs better. And I think for the most part, we're measuring the wrong things. So, so that's my thing there. You basically stole one of mine I was going to use. So kudos, I guess. Um, all right. Buzzer. All right. Yeah. Uh, we, alignment. There we go. We've achieved alignment uh, or enlightenment, one of the two. But um, if I could add to that, uh, one of the biggest problems I have with all the HR, uh, machine learning and AI applications right now is that there's a fundamental rule people need to watch, which is just because you can does not necessarily mean you should use these technologies in all cases. And the, the best example is like facial recognition. I'm actually OK with it if you just want to know, is that John Reed logging, you know, com tr coming up to the front door of the building and should I let him in? That way you can do that. I'm okay with that because no one has to touch any surfaces. There's no sanitation issue or health and safety issue there. Just let the facial recognition recognize the employee and give them, allow them entrance. But if you're using facial recognition to figure out who's going to the bathroom, how long you're spending time in there and all these other kind of invasive things, or you're using it to score someone's intelligence or whatever, video interviewing, then I think I have a real problem with that. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you on that one, John. Uh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but, um, but yeah, I, interacting with people is really important. The problem is the the Amazon people don't actually interact. It, it's not in their KPIs to do so. And uh, I, I, I absolutely like delivery people. I mean, I, they, I depend on them. Um, my UPS delivery people are fantastic. If you do a search online, you can see that the morale of Amazon delivery people is unbelievably low So uh, compared to their competition. So it's just their business model. They're, they're, it's a gig economy model. I Yes, I'm biased against gig economy work models for the most part. Um, and I've you know, I feel the same way about Uber drivers and everything else. I think they're mostly getting a raw deal. So anyway, on we go. So like I said, I'm, I'm down to four, uh, not five now, but uh, I'll give you a new one here. Uh, where I talked before about get all the uh, integrations nailed down. The other thing is to get not just customizations, but benefits right. And benefits actually can be really interesting. Um, uh, when, the, when I've run into a company that wants to be either an Inc. 5000 on the SMB side or a Fortune magazine best places to work kind of company, uh, they get really turned on by the idea of coming up with some really cool, interesting and amazing benefits they want to offer people. And I'll give you an example. One of my clients had a very unique way of doing tuition reimbursement and the way of, instead of the usual mechanism you'd find in most packages. The usual method being you're an employee, you want to go take some kind of continuing education. If a manager signed off on it, then you would, you paid to go to school. And once you got your report card or whatever, your grade to show that you successfully completed, then you could apply and get a, an expense reimbursement for that. But the way this company wanted to do it was all you had to do was tell your boss your intention to take a class and what it was going to cost. And they cut you a check right then and there. And then you had to build all this custom software to track and follow up with an employee to make sure they actually did take the course. And if they didn't pass it, then there was this whole new mechanism in accounts payable that had to be created to start dunning person or taking payroll withdrawals to get the money back to the company. I've had a lot of interesting conversations with companies with some of the, uh, I'm going to use the word 
innovative benefits ideas that they've had um not because of anything that's necessarily illegal or anything like that or unethical it's just that the administration of them can be a real nightmare if mm. you don't get it right anyway so that was my point on that one and and I, and I know some of the listeners are going like brian that's insane but i'm telling you folks this is the kind of stuff that gets people who set policy in companies all wound up uh you know on an issue like this because it was somebody's pet project probably 10 years ago and they want you to carry that forward in the future and it may be really difficult to do that with a new system and it may not even be really economical to do it anymore uh and then there's a question what do we do with the folks who were grandfathered under it before and blah 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 and you know i mean you could sink a thousand hours into solving just one problem like this cool anyway. all right my number two is uh i was going to say continuous but that's kind of buzzy so i'll just say regular feedback not yearly performance report cards so one of my big things in hr is moving away from that kind of yearly report card of how you did and figuring out a way to, to have constant dialogue with managers and the good thing is that uh -oh, brian is your dog upset with my uh comment there yes yeah, uh roxy <laughs> my german shepherd clearly disagreed with you on that point Does I, appreciate my performance uh, review i'm yeah. in fact it's going to be on your performance review you're going to get a whole bunch of bow wow wow Ouch. wow running over there okay because because part of to, to me part of the real opportunity was so-called like the happier side of so-called modern software including modern hr software is to be able to act on data sooner and and hopefully do it in an empowering way so if if you can tell that an employee is 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 struggling um why not reach out to them sooner why why wait a whole year to issue some type of performance review and so to me when i see companies striving for that and the ones i've talked to they're overall having good experiences i mean look it's not always easy because as an employee you don't want to walk in every day and have a report card waiting on your desk i'm not saying that but 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 the idea of having a more regular feedback loop to help you improve and to have a pipeline into your manager with your issues is is important i think and by the way, you were talking about UPS and FedEx, so I just got, that was what Roxy was uh, having a cow about. Oh, yeah? You got something? Want to uh, open yeah. it on the air? Yeah, we're doing the unopening like on YouTube here. I'll open oh, it right cool. Now. I got my pocket knife, uh, wherever they, there it is. Um, opening as we speak. It's real time, folks. Let's see what it is. Uh, uh, I didn't really plan uh, for this delay in the broadcast. Uh, <laughs> there it is, folks. A bottle of wine. Uh, whoops, there it is. So oh, cool. Not making it up. Uh, something nice. called Salus, uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon. I bet it pairs nicely with Dr. Pepper. That's what I'm hoping for, at least. Mm. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you, whoever sent me this. I'll figure that out after the broadcast. If you want to drink some on the air, I don't really have a policy against uh, that. No, I, uh, that'll take too long for me to go get a glass and the corkscrew. I'll have to dig that out of some box. But anyway, um, uh, anyway, that's what uh, that's what Roxy's got a problem with right now. Cool. Uh, um, before we get to our number ones, uh, do we have uh, any HR folks in the audience who want to share any of the keys for successful HR projects while we're on the the keys to success here feel free to type those in those in we would also accept uh any any failures that we've overlooked that you'd like to call attention to but mm -hmm. but we're on the success tip right now so we're trying to focus on that for a moment anyway brian what's your number one man my top one for uh this list would be take the time to seriously revalidate the data uh I, I'm always surprised how many like phantom employees are in the system well, still or uh, how inaccurate like withholding information could be uh, whatever I mean you gotta you know don't don't underestimate what the cleanup effort might be even though you think you know how good your data is in the old HR system it may not be that way at all the other thing is kind of fascinating is the way the new system will operate it's going to use the information differently than the way your old system did and um, it's kind of like that mutual fund ad you know uh, you know past results may not be any indication of future you know capabilities here so watch out for that I don't know who uh, Joe Rogan is, so I can't know if that 
if I could take it just too much of a compliment or not. But I, I, I do. John, you be sure and take that as a compliment, but go ahead. Um, okay. I mean, he looks like a cool dude. So see, it seems promising. <laughs> seems promising to me. Um, I, to, to be honest with you, I'm really more of a, of a writer than a, than a video personality. I'm, if I have to choose between the two, I'll, I'll hunker over the, the word craft because that's where I really come to understand, I think, projects a little bit better. But having said that, you know, it's really nice to have, have this back in action again and have like a Padre Brian, Brian along board as well. So um, my number one, Brian, you're going to relate to, I think, quite well, which is don't trust your quote unquote AI filters to be unbiased. I'm speaking especially towards recruiting and applicant tracking systems, infamously known as ATS. They're probably excluding talented and diverse applicants. Recruit for talent, not job requirements. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a big one for me. And I will point people towards a classic piece she wrote five years ago on Diginomica. You've, you've written about this since then, but you wrote a really nice one. You're not our kind of people. Why analytics and HR fail many good people. But you've, you've been kind of going on about this in various ways, that there's a real danger to these technologies. Yeah, the... Uh the ATS is one is often my biggest, most despicable piece of technology that I end up writing about a lot because of how they how they don't work well. Um, one vendor, I'll just share this, actually let me submit my resume to their ATS and score it. Oh, and they right. It. You got scored, right? Yes, I got scored, schooled, scored, whatever. And um What's interesting, folks, on my resume, and I don't want this to sound in the least bit, uh, whatever, self-promotional here, but there's a line, a single line in the upper half that says I've done a, a guest lectures at the Wharton School of Business, Harvard Graduate School of Business, um, the Northwestern Kellogg School, something like that. And then at the bottom of this one-page resume, it actually has my two or three degrees down there. There's the uh, University of Texas at Austin, and I've got a, an MBA in finance and so forth. Well, the way the ATS scored my resume, it saw those three graduate schools of business in the upper half of the resume, and it said that I'd been a student at all three schools and didn't graduate any of them because I had no degree or graduation date listed. And so they're treating me as if I was a college dropout, a serial college dropout. And it never picked up the stuff on the bottom of the resume where it actually had the degree, the date, the university, even the city of where I went you know, to school. So yeah, I pointed that out to the vendor and I thought, are you gonna fix your ATS technology to deal with that? And the answer was, we'll look into it. Well, you know, that's been, couple of years now and they still haven't got into it yet that and that's the real problem most ATS systems have no feedback mechanism because people don't know that they got flushed out and they don't know why so if you don't know you've been kicked out and you don't know why then how can you give any feedback to the company to go fix your, your ATS anyway sorry this is this one you're right this is a hot button for me let's go back to you being Joe Rogan here now uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I was I was reading back on your piece because I think there's a couple of really important points that that, that you made um, here uh, in the 2015 article. You said uh, you heard from a lot of HR people in high turnover industries that they should be able to target recruits with highly probable retention characteristics. And you went on to say what they're really saying is that it is okay for them to discriminate if a math model told them it's okay to do so. So I think yeah. that's a critically important point, which is the ability to hide behind an algorithm, which may not be fair. And and you make another really crucial point later on in that piece where you say the current crop of big data HR tools, uh, it's, they favor large population sets. Um, Correct. They, they don't favor uh people who aren't well represented and you used you used an example of a, someone from a rural religious mixed race family from the tonga or whatever and that you would you might be the first person that that retention algorithm had ever seen and you wouldn't score well against conventional tool sets and stuff like that mm -hmm. um based on other longer tenured people so should they pass on your application well one would hope not you could be a great worker and so i think to me like in the talent part of HR, this is the critical issue going forward. Yep. 
I mean, none of these tools are any smarter than the database that they're relying off of, if you will. And if they don't have the data, then they basically punt. And it's those punting decisions that screw people. And uh, I've hired hundreds of people in my life, and I can tell you that some of the best people are folks that have intangible qualities about them that I've never seen an algorithm be able to pick up. And I know I'm probably going to get an earful from some company going, oh, but Brian, we can measure the, their, the genuineness of their people. Um, this comment's so big, it's, it's hogging our faces, so we got to take it down pretty quick. <laughs> what are they saying here? Let's see. Uh, crappy job sites, advertise retail, give younger generation hopes. Tried help, helping my 16-year-old son add his profile. Nothing gives confidence in cheap recruitment companies. Well, true, right? And and getting that foot in the door, right? Like your son's a really hard worker, what have you. How do you get that across to the algorithm? It's sort of like this classic modern HR problem that we're dealing with now. So, so I, I, interesting. I was on a briefing call with a vendor uh, yesterday. We were doing a long conversation about, of all things, employee experience. And I started that presentation off by uh, showing a graduation picture of my son when he was coming out of college. And I told him in his last year at school, uh, there was a meeting there on campus. They had 100 to 200 uh, campus recruiters from major employers all over the country and they picked three students my son was one of them and these recruiters wanted to ask him questions kind of get the pulse of what today's new college grad is talking you know thinking about somebody asked a question to my son and it was is there any kind of firm that you would not go on an interview with and Kudos to Sean. I mean, he just, he came at him right like his old man would have. And um, he said, yeah, I got a couple of things I'm not going to do. If you use this piece of software called Tail O, I'm not going to even fill in the application online. And he was referring mm -hmm. to Taleo. The yeah, I thought one. so. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and that, you know, and this story is, I don't know, four or five years old now. But anyway, and then he said, and if you, and if I give you my resume, that should be enough. You should either have scanning technology or something. I should not have to rekey my entire resume into your, uh, you know, your application system. And if your pre-hiring technology is this behind the times, then why would I want to go to work for your company? Because you probably still use like green screen computers, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on the shop floor or whatever. And anyway, he just went on and on about, you know, like, you know, he has no interest in working for companies that can't take their iPad and take a picture of a resume and call that an application at that point. He goes, we haven't done anything other than a quick two minute meeting. And now you want me to go to your website and spend 45 minutes of my life on a system where you may never even have the courtesy to call me back and let me know. Well, we decided to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, sorry for the long answer. But yeah, that's that is a problem. Well, do we want to? We want to, I know we've been on here a while, John. Do we want to go to the predictive end and close this on more of a humorous note? Or what do you want to do next? Yeah, I think we can go there in just a minute. Uh, so a few people have been asking us. Uh, I think you actually um, got us going on Twitter a little bit um, around our, our annual predictions. And, well, in our case, unpredictions uh, piece that we do for, for Diginomica. Um, I, I want to thank anyone who joined us for the HR piece of this. And it's something we can get back to because there's, you know, I feel like we only scratch the surface of some of this stuff, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, as far as the predictions are concerned, I, I put out on Twitter the other day, I said, um, grouchy John made an appearance on a PR email response <laughs> yeah, today <I> saw <laughs> about the automatic future, automatical future of AI. I can't stand predictions pieces. And that was before last year when the pandemic exposed the entire IT predictions industry as a fraud. Now you and I have been poking fun at the predictions industry for, for, for a while now. Yeah. Um, so uh, with our annual on predictions. And so we had a call a little while ago, like, are we going to do that this year? Cause this is such a crazy year. Well, yes, we are. Uh, I don't have all the teasers lined up, but we are. We're going to do it. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to 
Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to share some uh, some thoughts here for everybody. So, uh, I, and I hate to give away. Well, what you don't know is that John and I will start passing back and forth a, a Word document, and we start putting down the most outrageous predictions that we know are obviously not really predictions. And at the end of the process, uh, we'll probably end up with about seventy-five of these bad boys, and then. John somehow decides he doesn't like the way I wrote something, so he kills a bunch of them. I'm just kidding. And uh, we kind of winnow it down to the top 10 or 11. And last year, we had an additional 11 because we had so many good ones in there, and a lot end up on the cutting room floor. So we haven't gotten quite right. to that point yet. But we also add some other things to the unpredictions. We talk about like new entertainment shows that are going to appeal to the techies out there. And we also talk about new technology words or buzzwords that are going to come up every year. And on the buzzwords, there were two of them last year that still make me chuckle. One was called platulence. Uh, this is the result oh, yeah. of marketers hyping up a pile of unrelated microservices as a platform platulence uh you know uh, indeed yes yeah and uh, boy there's been a lot of erp replatforming and platulence going on lately this year another word last year was a new word we thought was going to take over you know 2020 was frauded and that was how an erp vendor cooks up a bunch of audit charges that can miraculously go away with the customer buying a bunch of new shelfware and uh that's definitely been going on there's been a lot of that frauded stuff happening uh this year um we we had a bunch of them you're always welcome you can go to google and just type in uh, diginomica unpredictions undash predictions and you'll find several years worth of those things i know the one i think john loved the most last year is we thought there would be a hit tv show called keeping up with the kubernetes but uh obviously it, i don't know it just didn't get greenlit with all the COVID stuff this year um so, um, just real quick on for our UK listener. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, this is the only time that I can really, this is the earliest time I can make it work because of other stuff I have going on. So it's going to be Friday for Eastern time, which is not ideal for the Euro audience. I acknowledge that. The beauty is there's replays and, and audio too. So, um, and f yeah, f uh, feel free. And I'm, I do apologize sincerely for that, but I, I need to stick with the time that I can do every week. And this is, like realistically the time that works so i do apologize well and uh and i like being live you do influence the chat so really sorry to ruin your friday nights but feel free to <laughs> feel, feel free to skip hey the good news is you don't have to come next week because next week is an american holiday folks called thanksgiving where well, well, people gather together and spread a toxic virus so uh so so next well, friday we're taking a break so I was going to say, what'll make the next uh, view, you know, viewing of it better is you got to have a bottle of this stuff right in front of you, you know, when you're watching John and I talk. All right. Um, well, we were on the subject for this year. I think one of them I've toyed around with is a new word I think might really take off in 2021. Are you ready for this, John? It's called resiliousness. It's silliness, resiliousness. It's the uh, the unbelievable hype around resilient organizations. So, you know, let's let's start working that in. Tweet that up right now, uh, folks. Just make sure we get attribution on it. But uh, and. Yeah, before you go to bed tonight, uh, be sure and type something resilience, uh, resiliness, excuse me, in there. Please do. Uh, and thanks for adapting your Friday night. And, and by the way, another issue is that Friday at three, which I might be able to do, which is an hour earlier, my uh, my friend Brent Leary does his um, sports enterprise show. And Brent's the one that actually helped to get me up and running again. So I'm not going to program over him. It's just a loyalty thing. So um, anyhow, uh, yeah. And uh, every, every weekend enterprise hits and misses, uh, which this show is, is loosely inspired by my weekly column, which comes out on Monday. Uh, I do whiffs um, that are kind of off topic. So we always wrap up the show with one or two of those. I didn't mean to pick on Amazon so much this week, but I couldn't resist um, that Amazon ring made the whiffs again. Uh, not for privacy this time, but for recalling 350,000 video doorbells after reports of the devices catching fire. I saw and, that. I saw that. And maybe maybe finally realized that 
I bought a lower cost unit five years ago that from another brand and I'm starting to like that now. Uh, the idea of seeing my front of my house catching on fire didn't really appeal to me, but anyway, that was cool. And then we got a UK oriented oriented whiff uh, from Amazon. They made a geography geography fail and inadvertently united Ireland uh, with the United Kingdom yep. uh, during a support call. Oh. So, and I said, I didn't understand why peeps are giving Amazon such a hard time for <laughs> uniting Ireland because that's not an easy thing to do. And Amazon was able to unite Ireland in one support call. So, which, uh, which of course they late, uh, support, I think it was a public thing too. So they had to later apologize for that. So, uh, uh, I, we all have to bone up on our geography, I guess, if we're going to get through this. So, um, yeah, that's basically all I had for you guys. I just wanted to, um, mention to our audio listeners, if you're at all confused by any of this, it's because it is originally a video broadcast. I'm doing my best to, uh, make it audio friendly by reading all the comments and such. Um, but it does happen at four Eastern time on Fridays. And there are also video replays available on multiple platforms, including YouTube and LinkedIn. Um, so if you really want to watch the video, you can, but if hopefully you're enjoying the audio and I know a number of you are, so I just wanted to explain that. And for those of you video watchers who are like, what the heck? Um, it's a little bit different. This is more like a talk radio format. So that's why it runs a bit long. It's the goal is to kind of people dip in and out, uh, pester us with questions and snark, hopefully get a few things they can take away. And I think so far the format's working. We have to do a little more work to get the word out and stuff, but th we're just four weeks in. So I really want to thank those of you who uh, participate. And obviously LinkedIn user is an MVP candidate tonight with a lot of really smart comments. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, well, your ring doorbell might not be part of the recall, so that would be a bonus for you. Uh, I, I think it was only a small collection of the units that are affected. So uh, hopefully Amazon can move past this and and continue with invading our privacy in exchange for convenience. Uh, as as a proud owner of Echo devices uh, here would, would put it. So, Brian, any uh, last words to the peeps? Um, just be on the lookout. I'm doing a bunch of research uh, pieces that'll be coming out. I think I'll be doing one. Uh, you'll see one on an education ERP product uh, from a company called Elucian. I've written it. I just need to dust it off and send it off to you and Stuart and the rest of the gang Ooh. at Digitomica. I've got uh, the month and brief piece. I'm going to do that probably in between bites of Thanksgiving uh, meal, but it's pretty much there. That, story, that thing's done. And I just commented earlier about how I did a whole a big old briefing, a huge chunk of stuff on employee experience. And um, let's just say I came away with some new kind of insights there, particularly with why I think that's probably maybe a better market than possibly the employee engagement market. And I'll save that. I'll leave that as a teaser and Ooh. tell people to read it, you know, the articles later on. Nice tease. Very good. Yeah. And, oh, and, oh, go oh, ahead, no, Brian. I, I was going to say, in between all that, I just found out today I'm going to be leading a big um, Factory of the Future project, um, a global deal. So oh, I'll, cool. probably, I'll probably have a whole new set of perspectives about the software industry when I get through with that thing in a few months. But anyway. we, might have to, we might have to do a connected manufacturing blowout at some point and apply the, <laughs> apply the buzzword filter to that area. Oh, yes. There's, uh, you need a dictionary to get through all the acronyms and all that kind of stuff. But anyway. Well, we look forward to you building the factory of the future. I wonder if it will manufacture badges, conference badges. I guess we'll find <laughs> out. Oh, I haven't added to my uh, lanyard bowl in a long time now since June. Yeah, it has, has been a little bit, huh? Yeah, yeah. In, indeed. So, yeah, okay, well, I, th I think we're good. I keep feeling like there's something else I wanted to say, but it doesn't really matter. We'll do it again. Uh, I'll well, see you guys in two weeks. What's that, Brian? I was going to say, if you want, there is one prediction I've worked up uh, for our unpredictions piece, and, uh, and it goes something like this. Uh, having rebranded in 2018, ServiceNow uh, gets caught up in all the new um, – pandemic you know re, uh, stuff and wants to be known in the future as service now and forever and, and forever uh, well but not I love to, it yeah well 
But, and part of that is they're going to open up a new service now kind of university for advanced like post pandemic training for the workforce. And that's going to be called service now and forever university or snafu. Anyway. Um, oh, snafu. <laughs> nice. So I like uh, that. That's uh, Brian. I, I got a special sound effect for you for that one. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, John, I'll be working up uh, that. Please send us your your most outrageous and uh, stupid and silliest kind of unpredictions. And uh, we have no shame in plugging somebody else's effort if you got a good one. So send it along. Thanks. And thanks for having me on here today, John. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We had a good time. I'll catch you guys in two weeks. See you. All right.